Um, so in my dream, let me read this here. I was alone in the ghetto somewhere. And it was kind of scary and dark. There were some weird people and they, were, they seemed like bad people. And they were around, they're just walking around talking really loud. I couldn't hear what they were saying. In my mind, I think they didn't like me and they wanted to hurt me. I ran into my house. It was an old shack. And I wanted to hide. There wasn't much protection here because the door's loose and the windows are open and the sheets were like the window pane, you know? Anyone can come in if they wanted to. So I was kind of scared and worried about these people that might hurt me. So I grabbed a little meat knife, the kind you cut bread or meat, you know, like steak. And I wanted to defend myself because I was afraid that they would come and attack me. Okay, next scene. I will talk about this in a little bit. I'm smiling. This is scene number two in the same dream. I'm smiling, walking confidently in the street, and I see twin. You know, my, my computer or my Siri calls her Tuyen Nuyen. That's funny. <laughs> twin Nuyen. Okay, you guys know twin, right? Okay. And uh, I was wearing a shirt that was, had a lot of buttons, but I left my shirt unbuttoned where you can see my undershirt. And she was with some folks, some church folks, and she saw me and she said, hey, that's Stephen. And he's very open about things. And he doesn't hide much. Then I saw her leading some young people to reach out to kids in the neighborhood. She was very bold and compassionate and the kids began to open up to her. And she looked at us and quoted the scripture in John 4.18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. I woke up. What does this mean? Okay. So, of course, you have to pray about your dreams. So I believe in the dream, the Lord was showing me what it feels like to be without God, without hope, afraid, you know, lost soul, left to fend for myself. Okay. My house, the place where I live, the place where I feel like I belong. My life, okay, is an old shack. I ain't got much going, okay? My life is spiritually deprived of hope or future, okay? The house wasn't very secure. It speaks of insecurity, my life, my heart, and uncertainty. Were these people out to get me? That was what I kept asking. So I was very defensive. Probably not, but fear caused me to hide and be in protective, defensive mode, you know. Don't mess with me. I'm going to take you out, you know. In the spirit, the sword is the word we speak. In this case, I had a little meat knife, (laughs) okay. People in fear will say anything to defend themselves when under attack, okay. So, the reason why I'm speaking on this subject is because of this dream. Now, do you guys get kind of what this, where I'm getting to, okay. Now, here's the second scene. First, God was showing me how somebody who is lost and without hope feels and how they're full of fear and self-defense and protection. In the second scene, this is the part that's very encouraging and actually very affirming to me personally, you know. This is me, confident, joyful, open, and transparent. I wish I could be like that all the time, but uh, in the dream I was, okay? Okay. I've been twins' close friend and teacher for years, okay? So God was using her to relate to me, and he speaks the way you hear, okay? Twin speaks of the bride, a group of people, or the church, okay? Who is mature in love and leading or teaching or discipling the younger generation. Now, let me tell you a little bit about twin, okay? She used to, when you get in a conflict with you, she don't talk to you no more. She just ups and go and forgets about the relationship. Fear will cut off relationship. You know that? Okay. She just ups and runs, okay? Then she came back and broke through this time. And now you guys know what a wonderful lady she is, right? Okay. But she wasn't very confident before. Oh, uh, well, that was her past. Anyway, because she understands and had experienced love, she's not afraid, vulnerable, and is very transparent, 
pouring out her life fearlessly to reach out to those who don't know God, to the lost, the hopeless, the ones without future and hope. It takes somebody who is confident in love to walk into the darkness and be the light and to overcome your own fears and produce the very fruit of the Spirit. In a, and that's what brings people to repentance. You guys know that, right? It's the goodness and kindness the loving kindness of God that leads us to repentance, right? Okay, so she quotes this scripture. There is no fear. It means to be afraid, alarm, in love. Agapeo, love that's patient, kind. Love that's full of joy. Hopes, believes, and bears. Love that isn't puffed up. Love that doesn't seek itself, okay? That's the kind of love that casts out fear, okay? When you get around people who love you like that, Fear begins to diminish. It's easy to confess your sin to somebody who won't condemn you. It's easy to open up to somebody who will love you for who you are. It's easy to uh, pray with somebody and let them know everything about you because you know they will always love you. And they will never change their mind about you even though they see who you are. Okay? So... um, The word perfect love means to be complete, that's complete or mature or full of age in agape love. This kind of love casts out fear because fear, the Bible says, involves involves torment or punishment or infliction. But he who fears has not been made perfect or complete or mature or full of age in God's agape love. Okay? But we... Next verse goes, we love him because we, he first loved us. We love him because we have understood, we had an experience of his love, we have received his love, we have been empowered by his love. Somebody came and demonstrated his love, somebody came and revealed his love to us, and then all of a sudden we respond in love for God, and we worship him, and we honor him, and we obey him for who he is. I had a dream one time about this certain young lady who was in the youth. And in the dream, she was sleeping under a bridge. She was like this fatherless child. And she was very hopeless and afraid. And in the dream, I had to go and take care of her. I had to go and be almost a dad to her. But I had this fear in me. And it's like, what would people think? Okay. But... I had to overcome that fear and do what God was telling me to do. Well, this young lady, she don't have a dad. And I remember when I first met her, she didn't know how to relate to men. She was abused by men, so they were scary to her. I would give her a hug and she'd be like, you know, I would tell her nice things. She's like, you don't mean that. So all these fears, she pulled out her meat knife and starts, you know, defending herself, you know. <laughs> hiding, you know, and all that. But I kept giving my time, my money, and because I'm just obeying God, I think the one person is very important to God. If you think God's about big crowds, yeah, you know, he likes that. But you know what? He's more interested in that one person that he tells you to reach, you know? And so, one day, I gave her a hug, and she actually hugged me back. And I thought... What happened to you? And then she began to tell me nice things. And she began to say she appreciates me. And she's sorry for love. Broke through, cast out fear. And now she has repented of her ways. And she's one of the godliest people I know right now, you know. So I don't date right now because I'm too busy with school. And, you know, and I mean, all these boys want to date her. And she's like, no, not yet. I'm not ready. And she has a disciplined mind. It's amazing. She's strong in the Lord. She hears God. But fear had to be taken out. Break through that fear. Okay. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes affirmation. So I remember one morning at 2 a.m. She calls me up and she said, there's a demon in my house. I cannot sleep. I'm afraid. I'm trembling. And you know what I said to her? I want you to quote that scripture 
Repeat after me. Say, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of love and a power and a sound mind. And I want you to keep repeating it and take authority over that demon of fear. And it will leave you. I don't know why I knew it would hurt. She calls me the next day and said, Stephen, I slept fine. When I did that, the demon was gone and I was able to sleep. I think we all know this scripture and I'm not going to even read it off of here. The prodigal son says, Dad, I want my stuff. I want my inheritance. I want to go and party. Love does not control. Daddy gives him what he wants. Crazy, huh? That's it. Why would God give him his inheritance knowing that he would squander it? And then he goes away and he does all this stuff that are very not so nice, not so good. And he comes to the end of himself. He loses all his money. He gets hungry. And he's like, dude, I need to get back home because at least the servants eat better than I do now. I'm out here feeding the pigs. And this really sucks. And he said, I will arise and go to my father. That's all he said. He didn't do any kind of religious activity. He didn't try to get better. He hasn't done anything yet. He's just coming home. Let's just say he's seeking God. Decides he wants to seek God again. Or turn to the Lord again. And the father sees him from afar off. Way down. How did the father see him from afar off? Could it be that the father is waiting, longing, and hoping, and crying out for his son to return home? Or was the father angry at his son for being rebellious? Or was the father disappointed in his son and said, Man, I don't know if I should keep him or disown him. No. I want you to see this. Dad was not angry at this bad boy. You might be, but dad ain't. And by the way, God's not angry at anyone here. Because all his anger manifested on the cross, on the body of Jesus. There is none left for you. He died once and for all. He took on humanity's wrath. There's no condemnation left for you. It doesn't matter what Christians say. There is no condemnation left for you. There's only condemnation for those who reject them. And he's pleading with us to come home. And he's saying to himself, I'm not worthy to be my father's son. But maybe if I go tell him that, maybe if I confess, what do you, the father sees him afar off. Maybe he's still way off in righteousness. Maybe he's not got it all together yet. Maybe he's still way off in his behavior. But because he said, I will rise, God is running after him. God is longing to embrace him once again. And he falls on his neck and kisses him. And the Bible uses the word kiss. It doesn't mean kiss one time. If you check it out in the Greek, it means he kept kissing him. And each kiss was driving out fear. Each kiss was driving out rejection. Each kiss was driving out condemnation, self-hatred. Each kiss of the Father's love, let Him kiss me with the kisses of His mouth, speaks of the Word of God, the truth of what He says you are and not what you say or think or people say you are, drives out this nasty stuff we call fear that keeps us from relationship with God and with people. We know that it keeps us with people more than anything. And he's kissing his fears away. Son, I love you. You're still my son. He gives him the ring, restores him into the family business. He gives him a robe. He celebrates him. He rejoices over his son. He celebrates this son that doesn't deserve any of this yet by our religious standards. But grace says, yes, I love you. I will always love you. 
He's not relating to his son of course. Based on his son's commitment, he is committed to loving his son. I want to tell you guys, God is infinitely, eternally committed to loving you in your weakness.